Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound People and Music Industry podcast. I'm Sam Ingalls and I'm very pleased today to be joined by Adam Audio's Adam Shepherd. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about Adam, the company. Adam has been around for more than 20 years now, but over the last five years, you've seen quite a lot of growth following a bit of a crisis. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what happened and how you've steered the company in a new direction? Totally. Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for, for having me on here today. Uh, this is really cool. So I'm glad we can chat and talk a little bit about these things. Um, also, my name is Adam, but there's no relation. Uh, I get that I get that question all the time, and, and it's a lot of fun. Sometimes I just lie and try and convince people that I started the company, but it just never works. Nobody ever listens to me. Um, but yeah, okay, so, so, so to your question there. Yeah, we've been around for about 20 years now. I've been with the company for about five. The last five, I can get into that a little bit here uh, with this question. But uh, what happened was really simple. You mentioned the crisis. Uh, what happened was, was an insolvency in 2015. The company hit a little bit of a financial difficult place. Um, and the company went and solved it, and it was purchased by an outside-of-industry investment group uh, in the middle of 2015. And that outside-of-the-industry part is, I think, a, a key element to this story, and I can you know, talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, Not a lot of end users and our users really know what happened or that even anything happened. We tried to keep it as seamless as possible. Um, and, and really, our dealer partners were the ones who knew that there were some, some issues going on on the backside. So uh, like you said, it, it was a crisis in a sense, but where we've moved and the place we are now today is a really cool one. Um, and the answer to how that happened is simple as well. Simple insolvency and simple people. So we moved into moving it into kind of the, the people side of the conversation. That outside investment group that I mentioned that, that picked up the company in 2015 knew that it was very important to put the right team together um, and especially the right starting team. So they went to some industry of industry vets, especially here in the States, um, names like David Hetrick, previously with Biodynamic and KRK, David Angris, um, who's had um, a very long, uh, long history within our industry from, from Guitar Center to, to JBL to a lot of different companies. Um, that investment group really knew that we needed some industry vets to, to sort of guide this process out of that crisis into um, back to where the company really needed to sit and needed to be. Um, as part of that, the U.S. operation was completely shifted around, you know, and, and while I can, I can speak to a lot of the U.S. operation stuff because I was part of it for these last five years, um, there's a lot that went on outside as well. But at least here in the States, uh, the company really was a one-man operation for, for a very long time. Uh, which is very difficult with a growing company to keep it as sort of that one-man operation who's who's answering the phone and taking the orders and answering customer questions and packing the pallets and doing all that. I mean, it's it, it was a lot. So so the first thing that was decided was that the U.S. needed to be a team, not just one person. Um, once uh, you know, I was added on and a couple other people, we started hitting the ground running. Uh, realistically, running probably isn't the right the right way to say it. We, we hit the ground listening. You know, we, we went into our dealer partners. We listened to the problems that had happened. We listened to the, the problems of the industry, of our, of our competitors, of, of all the things and, and that kind of, that make up our, our world with the, the manufacturer to dealer relationships. And we took that insight and redeveloped how Adam was going to be kind of perceived here in the States. Um, and then we, we took some of those, those learnings and, and applied it across, across the whole company. Um, part of that, product decisions, uh, taking some insight from, from, from our world, from our pro audio world uh, around um, here in the States and, and internationally, and some really key product launches at really key time to help us grow into where we're at. S-Series in 2017, um, an entry-level T-Series developed uh, and, and, and released in, in 2018. Uh, all the while rebuilding this team here in the States into something really cool. Christian Hellinger, I think you spoke with Christian Hellinger before our CEO. He was brought on in, in 2017, I think it was. Um, our marketing team was completely you know, redesigned and, and developed. And, and one of the coolest things, especially over the last year and a half, two years, uh, some of the marketing staff here in the States, as well as, as kind of an international effort, have really created this awesome voice and this awesome visual representation of our brand that you see out on, on our socials on YouTube. Um, and I think that's been a, a really key element in, in how our brand has, has 
restarted speaking to the customer and and restarted being being a visible brand within the marketplace. And lastly, probably one of the biggest uh, developments in the last five years was was the purchase by Focusrite. Uh, last year, we've been we've been with them for an entire year now. It is a a big family, a big warm family, um, an awesome place for us to sit, and and a really cool thing for the future. Um, we've been been really really excited about about the things that 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 will happen now that we have a, a different investment uh, a, a different view on on how our company you know can continue to grow within our industry that outside investment was super important with finding those business practices that needed to be changed now that those are changed and we've kind of developed this team we're, we're part of focus right and and we're looking to the future to to find ways to to work together and 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 grow so it's 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 a super cool time so how important was it for you to get that insight from a wider business perspective, not just from within the audio industry? S- super important. Um, you know, and, and with that came the addition of people, not just from the investment side, but the addition of, of key members of our executive team that are from outside the industry. It's, it's, it's crazy what happens when Um, you bring people from an outside view in to look at business practices, logistical practices, system practices, our international sales and marketing manager, uh, Alexander Sack, and I'm not sure if you've met him. Uh, he, he comes from outside the industry, but now after, you know, five years with us, I mean, he's, he's, he's basically an insider at this point, but he comes from like the Bosch world and, and the, the large corporation world. And he can, he can sniff out bad practices like that. You know, he, um, he was a, a very big part in, in changing things to, to help the company run smoother, become more profitable, become more stable, um, and turn us into to what we are today. And I guess in terms of public perception, there's probably some people out there who imagine Adam as this sort of global mega corporation bestriding the world like a behemoth, and others who <laughs> see Adam as a kind of boutique German manufacturer with a handful of employees and a bunch of international distributors. I mean, where, what's the true picture in terms of the size and shape of the company? That is a that's a really good question, and I, I think we kind of fit somewhere in between. Um, I'll give you some examples. So, so for the AX series and the S series, our tweeters are still hand folded in Berlin. It's a super boutiquey thing. In fact, a lot of the people who are folding those tweeters now um, have been with the company since the beginning. So, so that's that's not something that you do in in some giant mega production manufacturing operation. You know, we really know how important that tweeter is to us and how important the, the precision is. Uh, and, and we've decided to continue to hand fold and, and have a really close process with those tweeters for the, for the AX and, and the S series. Uh, but at the same time, like you mentioned, I mean, we have representation over, I think it's like 75 countries now. Um, so 75 countries we're in, we're approaching roughly a hundred people worldwide for just the Adam side of things. So we're, we're growing. Um, Here's a good way to explain it. Maybe. Have you ever been to Nashville? I'm sure you've been to Nashville, right? I've never been to Nashville. Really? No, not once. No. We got to come visit. You got to come visit. Uh, yeah, man. I would love to come to Nashville. So, so while 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 the the heart of the company, while the core of the company is in Berlin, I would I would almost attribute Adam Audio to like what Nashville is as a city. And any of the listeners here that that have been to Nashville can probably attest to this, or even live in Nashville can attest to this. Nashville is sort of like that medium big city with a small town feel, but that's growing every single day. Like that's a really good example of, of what Adam Audio is because we really try to have kind of that, 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 that focus to our customers, that, that small business, boutique business communication aspect um, while still being a pretty, pretty large company. And now that Adam is part of the Focusrite group, are we going to see a lot of knowledge sharing from Focusrite? Are we going to see other Focusrite technologies making their way into Adam products? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, as a manufacturer, um, you know, speaking of small town or small time and, and and big time, I'm going to give you like the super corporate answer here, um, which is not me at all. But you know, we're always developing new products and new ways to 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 serve our market. Uh, no, in reality, though, we really are. We're developing new things. Uh, the partnerships are being created. There's not a ton that I can talk about, um, but as you can imagine, there's only ways that we can partner and be better, right? We're both playing in the same world while not doing the exact same things. You know, we're we're creating loudspeakers in a studio monitoring environment. They're creating other products for um, 
for the studio, but there's technologies, there's DSP, there's things that we can talk about and work together on. And that's, that's um, you know, something that, that may or may not be happening behind the curtain, uh, if you will. But you know, it's not just that, you know, I mentioned earlier with a company like Focusrite and being acquired by a company like Focusrite, uh, they have so much knowledge in logistical supply chain systems, things that can help our company be better, not just from technology, but also from a business standpoint and, and growing. And, and as we continue to scale, how we can do that from a healthy perspective and, and from a from a better perspective. So, um, absolutely, answer is is yes. And I tr- trying to be as vague, but still give you an answer at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you mentioned earlier the core technology that's always been at the heart of Adam's loudspeakers, which is something called the air motion transformer, uh, popularly known as the ribbon tweeter. Can you explain a little bit about how this works and what makes it different from a conventional transducer? Absolutely. Um, I guess I should be the first to tell you that I, I am not the most super technical electro engineering guy, but I can tell you that... Um, Let's let's just talk about let's just talk about kind of like the basics of it. So so the air motion transformer is a folded ribbon, okay, and it moves air in a completely different way than the piston standard piston tweeter would. So uh, where we're talking, what we talk about with our air motion transformers is vibration as opposed to movement of air via one piece of metal moving in and out. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a different way to move air. Um, and, and that is kind of a key technology and a key part of our, our, our brand and a key part of our products. Uh, in addition to moving air differently, it also has more surface area. So in a typical uh, piston tweeter, you're talking about like an, roughly an inch of material, okay? Um, an inch tweeter. With the, the, the ribbon tweeter with the air motion transformer, you're kind of more in like that four inch range. Now it's folded down, but that surface area allows you to um, cross it over uh, quite a bit lower. It allows for more dynamics. Um, and in the end, what you get is a much different picture of the high end. And anybody who's, who's heard our products before um, has, really, has really come to, come to find that, that, that that's a super important part of the process. Um, the high end is more transparent. The high end is more detailed. It is definitely different. Um, and then from an ear fatigue perspective, we've, we've definitely found that the movement of that air in a different way translates to less ear fatigue um, and more time working and, and, uh, and, and that. So it's, it's just a whole different way to do things. And, and we, think it's the, we think it's the better way. Um, and, and we really like, uh, we really like what's happened with the air motion transfer. I mean, from, from all the way back, you said we've been around for 20 years. We have been around for 20 years and, and that tweeter has changed, um, slightly over the years. Right. But, but in reality, that technology is still pretty close to what we came to the market with. Uh, we've just, we've just kind of taken some feedback and, and, and redeveloped some things and, and tried to make it, um, um, even more transparent, even more dynamic and even better from an ear fatigue perspective. So the air motion transformer is found in all of your products, but it's only used for the tweeters. Is there a technical reason why you can't use an AMT transducer for a woofer? I think there there are definitely limitations on the low end. Um, we actually did years ago, we had a few products in our mains category um, that had an air motion transformer as the mid-range, and it was super cool. It was really, really different. Uh, we we chose to redevelop our mid range after that and kind of focus back on the woofer technology and and some cool stuff that I can maybe talk about later. Um, some other other parts of our our company and and development and R and D that have been really cool. Other technologies, but um, but yeah, I, it, it was really neat. And I've I've spent some time on those. Those products were out maybe ten years ago. And and it's it's really cool, but it was very different. And and I personally could could see those limitations and hear those limitations. Uh, and and I think that it, it took a certain it took a certain want and use case for that mid range air motion transformer. Uh, so so now we're sort of just still back to focusing on on just using it as a as a tweeter. And is it hard to overcome sort of consumer skepticism about an alternative technology like the AMT? Yeah yeah I I. I think that it's probably less difficult than some other technologies. Uh, what I've found, let's say you have a diehard user of a, of a standard piston tweeter for you know 20 plus years of, of their careers, and they want to try something different, and they move to one of our products. I find that um, 
I'll get a call within that first week or someone on our team will get a call within that first week with questions and trying to understand and figure out what's what's going on. But but I would say that the transition time, that adjustment is no more than two weeks for most people. You're not used to hearing things up there in reality, and you're going to hear more. Um, you're going to hear a different high end and you will take a little bit of time to adjust. You know, it, the the easy thing would be to say, no, you won't hear anything. You'll, you'll, you'll adjust immediately. But in reality, it's, it's not necessarily true. Some people take a little bit more time than others. Um, I actually was one of those people, to be quite honest. I was one of those people. Uh, but I know now, and it was pretty quick um, in, in my workflow and, and how things go and how what I listen for now compared to what I listened for before, it, it didn't take that long to realize that hearing what's up there is is key and once you understand where that's at you getting it to translate is is simple so your initial reaction might be oh this is kind of bright but then after a while you realize that's just because you're hearing information that other speakers aren't actually putting across to you yeah yeah i would even go as far to say just like you said bright might be the word to describe it but there's also a depth to that brightness that people might not be used to now i don't even really consider them bright uh, after after years and years of working on them now, um, but initially you might have that impression, but you've just you've just never really heard it heard the high end in that way before, and and after after a short bit of time, it it, it doesn't really affect you anymore. So you can <coughs> encounter this tweeter in the three main product ranges that Adam currently makes, which is the T series, the A series, and the S series. How are those ranges differentiated? Don't forget about the subs. We've got subs too. Oh, now they the don't subs. have yeah, they don't have air motion transformers in them, um, but but we do make subwoofers as well. So so yeah, let's start with the T series. T series 2018. It was an uh, our first kind of entry level price point monitor. It is it is a really solid monitor for that price conscious customer for that entry level studio home studio um, you know whatever it may be that has three products in it a five a seven and an eight and then also a subwoofer the T10s. That's going to be your 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 first monitor, your secondary set of monitors. Um, it, it's going to be kind of wh- where you start and where you become part of the Atom family. The A A series, or it's actually AX series, uh, is is our mid range kind of bread and butter project studio to pro studio has everything you need in it. You've got a a three, a five, a seven, an eight, and a and a dual seven in a midfield. So you have near field and you have midfields, and that's going to be your, like I said, your project studio, your um, your pro studio, uh, maybe smaller control rooms or, or certain control rooms, and then the S series obviously is our flagship, our highest end, the most discerning customer, the the, the mixing and mastering folks. Um, but you know, after five years now, I've I've come to find that you you can find different levels of monitor in many different types of places and uses, and we talk to people every day who use them for for different things. So. Um, but that's a basic rundown. So if as a user I was to move up from the T series to the AX series or from the AX series to the S series and re- keeping the same sort of equivalent size of monitor, what sort of improvements would I notice in the sound? So let's say from T to AX first, what you end up with um, is going to be probably first and foremost, you'll notice more headroom. And with more headroom comes a lot more flexibility. It's not just about volume when it comes to headroom. It, it's just it's it's about you know efficiency. It's about n- not hitting the limitations of those components so that you can you can have a nice really good understanding of what's going on. You know a good test of that with your monitors is is to play something that 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 let's say has a really great base baseline. You turn those monitors down. And that baseline will start to disappear. The quality amplifiers, the the moving up into the AX series technology, you're gonna you're gonna find those things are are much better. Um, as you move up, I mean, in reality these days, it it is one of those instances where you get what you pay for. As you move up, and as you move up in price points, you're gonna get higher quality amplifiers. You're gonna get higher quality components. With between the T and the AX, you move into the handmade tweeters, uh, more precision in the tweeters. Moving from the AX to the S, you get our DSP heart or DSP platform in the S series. And that that adds even more flexibility. So you're getting more headroom, you're getting higher, higher end amplifiers, you're getting higher end woofers, you're getting that DSP platform with parametric EQ, with built-in tunings, um, with the ability to to go in digital if you want to go in digital. Um, 
so you you just you just move up and you move up into different technologies and and uh, you know the S series also has a, a software option to be able to do um, your tuning adjustments. It's not room tuning, room correction, but you can you can make your adjustments in software and, and push it up to the speaker. So yeah, I mean those are some some basic differences. Did I did I answer that that well enough for you? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. Awesome. Well, I'm interested in this question of DSP because obviously it's one of those things that some consumers are still quite resistant to in loudspeakers and they want an old fashioned loudspeaker yeah. that's just a, a box that you plug your analog signal in and it makes it louder but other people are beginning to appreciate the benefits that dsp can bring i mean maybe you could outline a little bit what you see there's the key benefits there absolutely dsp is really cool from a manufacturing standpoint it's kind of a dream once in implementation it's a difficult process obviously to 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 develop that and and figure out how to integrate that but once it's there once it's in the product from a manufacturer's perspective changes running changes, things like that that need to be done, it, it's a dream. From the end user perspective, it, it gives you more flexibility than you've ever had. And it also brings you more into what we, as people living in a digital world, want and need. Like I said before, the DSP and that S series, the, that, that tuning, the EQ tuning, those are, those are key places where DSP are needed. Um, we can still do those analog knobs and dials like we do on the AX series. Um, but in the end, we know this world is moving digital. What am I talking about? It's already digital, you know. So, so those those needs those needs are changing, and 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 we're there to to meet them with with the S series, and and even the T series includes some of that DSP technology. It's not as accessible to the end user, um, but as we continue to grow, it's going to be DSP. There's just no way around it. Well, I guess a lot of people would say that traditional electroacoustic engineering, the actual loudspeaker design, is kind of a mature technology, and there's not really anywhere left to go with that so if you're going to improve speakers at all you've got to do it by doing dsp correction is is that something you would subscribe to yeah yeah i mean i i hate to put a limitation on something because obviously you know both of those things are part of our everyday product development life you know i, I don't really want to want to put a we've hit our limit we can't go any farther with with you know electroacoustics or, or, or whatever but we've found significant benefits with dsp like i said our world constantly requires more digital solutions i maybe put it this way when you think of the word e-commerce these days it's, it's a word that gets thrown around in reality we can drop that e right it's just commerce i mean this is this is how we work now we can we can drop that e but but in reality like ecom is based on traditional commerce just like the need and use for dsp is based on those electroacoustical engineering principles and those things so so we need both as part of this situation yeah yeah we we, we just we need both and i don't want to put a limitation on, on electroacoustics because i think there are definitely places that we can that we can continue to develop and grow um dsp is just a way to to help us move forward even more so another thing i would like to ask you about, if I may, is headphones, because a year or two back, Adam launched your first headphones, and more and more music is being consumed on headphones, more and more producers seem to be working on headphones. Do you think loudspeakers are still relevant? Do you still think they're still essential for music production? I mean, and if people have got the budget for, say, a pair of mid-price monitors, would they actually be better off buying really fancy headphones with that money? Yeah, it's, it's really funny you asked that question. Uh, our marketing team was doing photo shoots and video shoots over the last two weeks and has literally been asking almost this exact same question. Um, I personally don't think it's it's one or the other. I believe that both have a place and both have a use. What I can tell you, the, the feedback we're getting from those professional users that we are talking to every day and that especially the ones we've talked to, especially in the last couple of weeks is headphones are a really great way to stay productive while in movement, whether you're working remotely, whether you are working on a plane, it, it allows you to continue your pro productivity in a mobile workplace, in a mobile environment, but people are still wanting that experience. Uh, people are still wanting wanting a standard kind of stereo push sound into a room, feel it, you know, emotive sound, movement, those kind of things. It, it's still it's still a part of the of the creative process, and you know, may, maybe from a maybe from a solely a mixing standpoint, you know, from an analytical surgical mixing standpoint, you know, maybe maybe there's something to be said about about headphones eventually being something that that become more commonplace in use, and maybe you spend more time on headphones. But but in reality, especially in the production and the the songwriting side and the creation side, which are a lot of the customers we have. Um, I, I still think that the monitors are, are the emotional experience and the experience that we're still selling. But what, what do you think, man? I mean, where, where do you stand on that side? Well, I personally 
would be pretty reluctant to send anyone a mix that I hadn't played back on loudspeakers because yeah. while, whilst I think it's possible to mix on headphones, it's also possible to go really badly wrong when you're mixing on headphones and not really realise. So, yeah, I, my, personally, I wouldn't be without loudspeakers, but I love headphones too. Got it. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, and the double checking is something that's key too. I mean, it just w- with everything we double check on 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 in ears, we double check on on headphones, and and uh, and that's an important part of the part of the workflow too. So, yeah, I'm with you. Definitely with you. And I guess another phenomenon that we're seeing at the moment is more and more people working in environments that are not sort of traditional acoustically treated studio control rooms, whether they're setting up at home, they've got home studios. Does a monitor speaker for those kind of home environments need to have any different qualities from a monitor that's designed for use in a control room? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I, I would say mostly no, with a couple caveats. Mostly no. So th- there are definitely features and elements of monitors that can help you in different environments more than other environments, right? So the more fine-tuning options that you can, you can find in higher-end monitors, you know, with, with us, like with the S-Series, you may not be able to fully realize those benefits in a room like I'm sitting in right now. My, you know, this is, this is our, this is our third bedroom. It's our studio. You know, it's, it's a, it's a small room. We've done what we could with, with, um, you know, acoustic treatment. If I were to throw a high end monitor up in here and mess around with some of the those tuning capabilities and some of those those fine tuning capabilities i may not be able to see as many of the benefits as i could in a really well treated tr- traditional control room um with that said though it, it's not like it's not like it's it's these are only for this use these are only for this use you know it, you know vice versa if you were to take one of our t-series monitors and 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 put them up in a in a high-end studio uh there's nothing bad about that it's not like you're gonna you're gonna perf- they're gonna perform less or they're gonna be lesser than. It's it's just that that maybe you don't have a flexibility that you could fully realize with a higher end set of monitors um, as opposed to that entry level with the T series. Uh, but but yeah, I, honestly, over the last five years and talking to customers and going into people's spaces and spending time in studios from a bedroom to you know a high end studio that's been around for forty years or something like that. I've seen a lot of really crazy things. I've seen a lot of uses that would not be traditional. I've seen, you know, subwoofers up on stands. I've seen subwoofers in the back of rooms. I've seen midfield and main monitors being used in near field positions. And while we don't suggest it, people do it and it works, you know, it, it's what works for you. I I wouldn't put limitations on, on your room saying, I can't buy this series of monitor because I'm only in a bedroom. You can see benefits in, in, in that either way. There's not a ton of downsides. Well, let's talk subwoofers for a minute, if we may then, because that's another topic that really divides people. Some people just seem to be sort of philosophically against the idea of subwoofers and they insist that they have to have full range main speakers. Other people think there's no way you can achieve the same performance without a subwoofer. Um, Adam seemed to be very much on the second side in this uh, debate. Tell us a bit about the advantages of a subwoofer and why why you think they're necessary. I can can totally speak from personal experience on this. Um, You know, I haven't mixed a bunch of records. I haven't, I haven't done, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a credit list to my name, but I've, I've spent a lot of time working on music and a lot of time in studios. And, and I've, I've, come to realize just how important a subwoofer is, not only just to understand what's going on in the low end, but also to allow your biggest investment most of the time, your your monitors, your satellites, if you want to call them, if we're talking about a 2.1 setup, allow them to do what they do really, really well, right? So if you have a seven inch monitor, a standard two-way seven inch monitor, like, like we sell, like a lot of competitors sell, if you're not high passing, everything at a certain frequency. What you end up is is that monitor, let's say it gets down to 48, 42, having to recreate those frequencies, but also recreate recreate like 2800, right? The efficiency of the whole setup goes way down because those low frequencies require a lot of energy. The second you take that load off of those woofers and those amplifiers and allow that seven inch to just handle like 85, 100 and up, somewhere in that range, you get a lot of efficiency. We like to say, and it's a basic understanding, I mean, subwoofers are not for louder bass, they're for lower bass, right? They're for extension. They should they should extend your setup. If you are someone who likes to traditionally work on just a set of near fields or just a set of mid- midfields and not mess around with the subwoofer, I would say that you're probably not getting the most out of your setup 
because if you use that subwoofer, you can really let your monitors shine. And, and a lot of people, I mean, mains, like you said, I mean, mains, there's, there's, there's dual 15s out there, dual 12s out there. That's a lot of, a lot of dedicated woofer space. In instances like that, maybe you don't necessarily need a suffer, subwoofer when you've got dual 12s, dual 15s up on your wall. But for the most and majority of us, it definitely, um, we think is, it's definitely a necessity. And I, I think so too. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, if you do have these enormous main monitors, you end up with the other problem, which is that they stop being so much like a point source in the mid range and the high frequencies. So you introduce other problems there yeah. by making them able to pr reproduce these low frequencies so accurately. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. So good case there for buying a subwoofer. And yeah. uh, I'm sure you, you'll, say we, you'll say we should all buy an Adam subwoofer. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is that. My, this is my time, right? Is, is now when I'm supposed to say that? <laughs> Well, uh, it's been wonderful to talk to you, Adam, and I wonder if we could f finish this discussion by talking about something that you said. I've seen you quoted as saying, which I thought was a really striking phrase, which you said, we have lots of competitors and none of them suck. <laughs> I think that's a really brave thing to say. Absolutely. Um, so what's the thinking behind that? Definitely. Who knows? Maybe I'll get some calls here. Maybe I'll get in trouble. Um, no, I, I, I've said that for a long time and it's the truth and I can't be the only one thinking it, Right especially when you get into products like our AX range, when you start to spend $1,500 on a set of monitors, everybody's pretty much making a great product, right? I can't, I really can't knock anybody. At that point, it's, it's really a matter of preference. It's a matter of, do you like the, the voicing that, that that manufacturer has chosen? Have, do you like the, the capabilities? Do you like the, um, the flexibility that they may give you in tuning? Do you like a DSP platform as opposed to an analog platform? In reality though, everybody's making pretty good monitors. It, it's a really tough game out there. Luckily for us though, like we've talked about a lot, in this conversation, we've got that air motion transformer to talk about. Most people are dealing with, in reality, the same basic technical, physical things, a box with a couple holes in it and a woofer and a tweeter, a standard piston tweeter. We we don't have just that to talk about. We we do have that tweeter to talk about and some other technologies as well. But but yeah, that, that's the basis of it. You know, I, I really truly believe that. And, and I think that when you when you when you really get to looking at what's out there and the companies out there, you'll find that there's a lot of great things and, and you have a lot of great choices as an end user today um, and a lot of great options to, to look into. And I like to adopt that that viewpoint. Nobody in this world that we're playing in makes a bad product, so we have to set ourselves apart in other ways. And that forces you to try harder, I guess. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. From a sales perspective, from a product development perspective, for everything, um, it really breeds uh, innovation and, and breeds new ways to talk about things and do things and build things. Well, it's been fantastic to watch what you've achieved with Adam over the last five years. And um, I hope and I believe that you'll continue to grow in the future as well. So thanks ever so much for taking the time to talk to me today, Adam. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you very much. Are you kidding, man? This is awesome. Thank you for having me. This has been great. And I'm glad we could we could chat and talk about some of these things. And, and uh, yeah, I'd love to do it again whenever you want. Wonderful. Thanks ever so much. Uh, I've been Sam Ingalls. You've been listening to the Sound on Sound People and Music Industry podcast with Adam Shepard from Adam Audio. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. And just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcast website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels.